Because houses are nasty after somebody's died in it. Okay, and what does that mean? What do you mean? What do you mean by that? I get a lot of nightmares. I kept feeling things in there. Ugh. I just didn't want that. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Let's get straight into today's Dark Case. Our love and respect goes out to all those affected. In a quiet neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri, the Stouty family lived a seemingly ordinary life in their modest home. Diana and Mark Stouty were parents to their four children. Sean, a 26-year-old with autism who still lived at home. Sarah, a 24-year-old university graduate struggling with student loan debt. Rachel, a 22-year-old overachiever, and Brianna, a 9-year-old with learning disabilities. Rachel had exceptional abilities, excelling academically, showcasing artistic talent, and being multilingual, while her siblings all faced their own individual struggles. Diane's special attention and pride in Rachel were evident. This was reflected in her frequent praise and encouragement on social media, which displayed a notably closer and more affectionate bond between them than the other children. Diane's Facebook was filled with Rachel's accomplishments, her artwork and a continuous exchange of affectionate interactions, with minimal mentions of the rest of the family. The mother was seen by friends and a community as selfless, as a devout Christian mother who seemingly placed her family's needs above her own. She would juggle a full-time job as a clinical supervisor at United Healthcare. She played the organ at the Lutheran Church and raised four children. Diane portrayed an image of resilience and devotion. Her social media presence was a testament to her strong religious faith, regularly showing religious sayings, inspirational quotes and prayer requests. On the outside, there was nothing that hinted at the hatred brewing within Diane. Mark, her husband of 26 years, was seen as content and a dedicated father by his friends. Joining a local band in 2011, he appeared to relish in his role as a lead vocalist and guitarist, occasionally taking on bartending shifts and caring for Brianna too. From their children's perspective, Diane was seen as a typical, albeit somewhat stressed, mother. Despite their musical talents, the family still struggled financially, with Sarah having to live at home, which added a great deal to the family's tension. In April of 2012, son Sean started posting to Facebook. These posts documented the decline of his father. He wrote, My father is suffering from an incurable mental illness and is likely to die. My father is slowly starting to have problems with driving and accomplishing anything. When he drove a car, the car swerved a little bit. I had to help him keep the direction straight and properly turning. And then on the 5th of April, my father is so insane that don't want to be friends with him anymore. 6th of April, my father has changed from panic, aggressive and selfish to depressed. He took his car, wallet and cell phone. He said he would commit suicide rather than torment us. I don't know if I'll see him alive. He no longer cares about himself. He never truly listened to other people. If he is dead, I want to see him to make sure he is dead. Later on that day, Sean wrote, I need a better life. And then on the 7th of April, my father is slowly losing contact. He cares more about music and his computer than anything else, even his own welfare. My family is slowly reducing contact with my father because he no longer cares and worries about us. I've been feeling good since I started limiting contact with my father. I no longer walk with him or travel with him. I don't talk to him unless I'm saying something important. Later that day, my father is slowly getting sicker, his voice is slurred, his walking is wobbly, his body is more tired than normal. He had to rest when he realised his car driving was swerving the car a little bit. He is sleeping in bed longer than us. He may collapse under his weight at any time. On the 8th of April, 
My father is so weak that he must spend half of the day in bed. His motor skills are deteriorated to the point where he cannot mow a lawn properly or drive a vehicle safely. If he gets behind the steering wheel of any vehicle, his failing motor skills would put pets, people and himself in danger. And then the very next day, my father died. He lived a full life. The cause of death is a stroke. His funeral is this week. His belongings now belong to my sisters. Rachel, Diane's favourite daughter, wrote certain things in her diary which made things even more unsettling. The 22-year-old wrote, It's sad when I realised how my father will pass on in the next two months. Sean, my brother, will move on shortly after. It will be tough getting used to the changes, but everything will work out. These writings would prove to be ominous. And so, following the unexpected demise of her husband Mark, Diane's reaction struck friends and family as unnervingly detached. Despite the obvious loss, Diane seemed oddly unaffected, showing little emotion, and this surprised many who knew the couple well. Even during a gathering after Mark's memorial, her behaviour appeared celebratory rather than sorrowful, leaving friends like Mark Mancuso, Mark's friend and bandmate, puzzled by her seemingly unusual way of grieving. Diane Stoutis' detached response to tragedy continued when her 26-year-old son, Sean, passed away just five months after her husband. Sean, who had a history of seizures, complained of flu-like symptoms in the days leading up to his demise. Unlike her husband's passing, there was no memorial service for Sean. This left relatives to discover his demise through other family members. Rachel in particular raised eyebrows when she posted on social media about her mother's unusually relaxed mood just a month after Sean's death. The Facebook post read, don't think I've seen mom so chilled out like this for a long time. The family of six had now shrunk to a family of four, but this series of tragedies was far from over. Sarah, aware of her mother's desire for her to seek employment and her frustration with her student loans, discovered her mother's journal containing disturbing entries. Her words not only predicting the demise of her brother and father, but also hinting at her own demise. Sarah confronted her mother. Diane dismissed the journal and urged her not to read it further, leaving her daughter to believe that the matter was simply resolved. Diane's ability to hide her true feelings and motives astonished everyone, except that is, Rachel. She appeared to be the only one aware of the depth of rage and frustration hidden behind her mother's facade. In June of 2013, Sarah, the 24-year-old daughter, suddenly fell ill and was admitted to hospital. What initially appeared as flu-like symptoms quickly worsened with nausea, chills, diarrhea, headache and severe body aches. By the time she reached the emergency room, her organs were already failing. The situation surrounding Sarah's illness remained a mystery to doctors, as they constantly tested her for various conditions, all yielding negative results. As her condition remained critical, the medical staff struggled to pinpoint the cause of her deteriorating health, leaving Sarah's life hanging in the balance. Diane Stoutis' behaviour continued to be extremely odd. Despite her daughter's grave condition, the now 54-year-old mother appeared light-hearted, engaging in casual conversation with medical staff and discussing an upcoming vacation to Florida. Then, the police received an anonymous tip regarding the family, which was later found out to have been from Diane's pastor. Springfield police detectives revealed that the pastor expressed concerns not only about Diane's lack of emotional response after her husband's untimely demise, but also her bizarre behaviour following the family's tragic series of losses. And remember, she was the organist in church, so they would have spent a reasonable amount of time together. Rightfully so, the lack of expected grief raised suspicions, and the investigators began building their case. On June 21st, 2013, Diane Stoutie was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of first-degree assault, each of which carried a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. She was also charged with armed criminal action. Investigations also discovered that Diane was not the only person who had a finger in these losses. 24-year-old Rachel was believed to be equally as guilty. Upon inquiry, Rachel made a shocking confession. She had assisted her mother in the poisoning of her father, 
brother and sister. She was charged with first-degree murder in these deaths and also faced charges of first-degree assault and armed criminal action in relation to the severe injuries suffered by Sister Sarah. The arrests of both mother and daughter shook the town to its core. The exact moment when this mother and daughter team began the discussion about eliminating the rest of the family still remains a mystery. But evidence suggests long and extensive conversations between the two that eventually evolved from contemplation to meticulous planning. The plan involved extensive research and consideration of various methods, starting with suffocation and the combination of different substances or medications, all to be used to create a lethal mixture. The pair eventually settled on using antifreeze. They even went through the trouble of buying an odorless, tasteless version from the internet to evade detection. Casually slipping this deadly substance into Mark's Gatorade, as well as in Sean and Sarah's sodas, seemed effortless. They simply had to conceal the poison in their family's favourite beverages. So how are you guys getting her the drinks without her knowing about it? She's on the computer a lot, on YouTube a lot, on sites like that a lot. And she's easily distracted. It wouldn't take much to like whatever drink she did have and just slip it. Is that what you did? <laughs> yeah. The first target was 61-year-old Mark, described by Diane Stoughty as a source of frustration due to his lack of regular employment, as well as his alleged aggressive behaviour towards the family. What was your his marriage like? Um, how can I say? We were still married, but it was not what you call a good marriage. Mm -hmm. Have there been any infidelities on either side? He had. He yeah. had. So I'm guessing then just briefly thought he wasn't the best husband? Mm, probably not. Okay. not. Not to society, no. What do you mean by that, not to society? Well, he was running around and he would drink and smoke pot and so he wasn't a very good guy is what not, you're saying yeah i know you know i've had friends who told me i should kick him out but i couldn't find myself kicking him out did mark work at all no no he didn't work no so what did he do then uh play music okay and while rachel didn't harbor personal hatred towards her father she wanted to ease her mother's stress and discontent. And it was the $20,000 life insurance payout after Mark's demise that seemed to significantly lift Diane's spirits. And this money led to the family's relocation to a nicer home. However, Mark's murder seemed to trigger something in Diane. She quickly began plotting the end of her 26-year-old son, Sean. Despite Sean's inability to live independently due to his autism and seizures, it was his personality that had become intolerable to Diane. She viewed him as a nuisance, considering him worse than a pest. An opinion that sealed his fate in the scheme devised by his own mother and sister. Rachel, however, was not on his mother's side when it came to Sean. She disagreed with Diane and suggested that they simply place Sean in an assisted living facility instead but her concerns were overruled by Diane. Sean suffered similar symptoms to his father before his death in September of 2012, yet somehow no suspicions really arose. The mother-daughter duo delayed poisoning Sarah until June of 2013, citing Sarah's perceived lack of effort in finding employment, along with her idle activities as reasons for her potential demise. Diane, tired of being the sole provider and uninterested in paying off Sarah's student loans, had grown more and more motivated to eliminate her daughter. Rachel additionally mentioned Sarah's nosiness as a contributing factor, but something went wrong and Sarah survived. However, this was not the end. There was still 12-year-old Brianna. Diane claimed she spared her youngest child out of love and because she wasn't a burden. However, Rachel's accounts of the police contradicted this. She confessed that they had already planned Brianna's demise. Allegedly, Diane didn't want the responsibility of caring for Brianna anymore, a girl who had learning disabilities and needed additional support in school. Rachel said that she was unable to care for her younger sister because she couldn't even take care of herself. 
Diane's bitterness and resentment towards her targeted family members can clearly be seen in her confession videos. While Rachel appears to perhaps be just echoing her mother's grievances, Diane's motivation seemed rooted in anger, while Rachel seemed influenced by a desire for an exclusive, idealised connection with her mother, envisioning a life only with Diane, a mother and a favoured child living happily together, happily ever after. Even during her confession, Diane displayed minimal genuine remorse or regret for her actions, and love appeared to be noticeably absent. The nature of Diane's relationships with Rachel raised questions. Diane seemed to value what Rachel offered her, adoration, sympathy, and the illusion of a successful parent. However, grooming a child to be a partner in crime, especially against her own family, is clearly completely contradictory with parental love. Diane's willingness to potentially sacrifice Rachel's future to fulfil her own desires underscores the troubling and manipulative dynamics within their relationship. For Diane Stoughty, her attempts to hide her involvement in a tragic event initially succeeded. No apparent suspicion fell upon her even after the third family member fell critically ill. However, the observations, combined with other evidence from police reports, from witness statements and medical records, eventually uncovered the truth. Diane Stoughty took an Alford plea. In an Alford plea, the defendant asserts her innocence, but acknowledges that the prosecution has enough evidence to potentially convince a judge or jury of their guilt. The court treats the plea as a guilty plea and proceeds with sentencing as if the defendant had pled guilty. Diane was sentenced in 2018 to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Rachel Stoughty pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in 2015, entering into a plea deal where she agreed to testify against her mother. She received two life terms with the possibility of parole after 42 and a half years. What's really amazing is the despair of the bad, that there are those who choose to forgive the ones who hurt them. And that takes a rare kind of bravery. Sarah Stoughty managed to make a miraculous recovery from the ICU, but she has suffered permanent damage with lifelong effects and is currently now in assisted living. Should you have for your mom, would you say? I forgive her mm -hmm. for what she did to me. Not only she took away my dad brother, but she took away my livelihood independence. Both mother and daughter have filed motions to vacate their pleas, a move met with silence from their legal representatives. They further await developments in the legal process. Diane Stoughty, despite confessing to the police, is now denying any involvement in the poisonings. She expressed apologies for the suffering that her family endured, but denied any part in the poisoning actions that led to their demise. Diane even hinted at being poisoned herself, although there is no evidence supporting her claim. However, the detectives responsible for the case clarify that the evidence points to Diane and Rachel as definitely being the individuals responsible for this case and refuted any additional involvement from anyone else. Do you think the punishments fit the crimes here? What do you think can be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.